Hello again, and uh, welcome to another uh, session of uh, Resident Basics, uh, Things to Understand and Know in GYN Pathology, uh, directed at those who are new in training, uh, and maybe some of those who have uh, been around for a little bit longer but are trying to refresh uh, on the topic of GYN Pathology. Today our topic is uh, the benign stuff in the cervix, uh, things that come up that uh, create some confusion and present challenges uh, for uh, diagnosis um, with uh, the more worrisome malignant lesions. So our objectives today are to recognize and diagnose those entities, differentiate them from uh, the uh, pertinent um, uh, significant uh, malignancies and pre-malignancies, uh, talk maybe a little bit about language for reporting, and then think overall again about how this affects and improves processes for patients. So uh, these uh, encompass the benign and tumor-like lesions, the metaplasias, the displacements, ectopias, polyploid lesions, cystic changes, hyperplasias. All of these uh, can be seen in the uh, cervix and endocervix and occasionally create the diagnostic problems. So here's a nice uh, example of a polyp. Um, and in this lesion, we see the, the rounded polypoid architecture. Uh, maybe you get a trace of a large vessel here. But what's happened here is that there's extensive squamous metaplasia in this polyp uh, that makes it look a little bit like a uh, cervical intraepithelial neoplasia or something uh, uh, potentially more serious. However, on higher magnification, we just see this very uh, nice matur maturing uh, phenomenon. We don't see hyperchromasia of the nuclei. We don't see mitotic figures. We don't see coilocytes or uh, pseudo uh, uh, wrinkled cells, raisinoid cells, and so forth. So this is just a benign squamous metaplasia. Another entity that is somewhat less uh, frequently encountered, uh, but that can also occasionally create problems is transitional metaplasia. Um, on uh, pap smears, this is usually readily distinguished from uh, uh, squamous intraepithelial lesions, but on biopsy, sometimes it's a little bit more difficult. Now, usually it's encountered in the endocervical canal in older women um, and presents as a part of the differential between atrophy and uh, high-grade SIL. Um, helpful features are the fact that this, these lesions do have nice nuclear grooves, which we don't usually see in uh, SIL. Um, and uh, cytokeratin staining is a little bit different uh, than in uh, normal uh, endocervical squamous uh, metaplasia. However, these antibodies are not typically present as differential uh, features in most uh, laboratories. And so we tend to rely more on P16 positivity, uh, KI67 proliferation rates, and so forth uh, to differentiate. Here's uh, what it looks like under the microscope. And you can see these nice oval cells with very uh, delicate uh, elongate uh, grooves along the long axis of the nucleus. And you can see how at low magnification, this sort of more cellular crowded uh, area could be mistaken for SIL. So uh, that's sort of the uh, metaplasias that we'll, tie, we'll touch on. And then we'll move on now to uh, talk about a couple of others, uh, tubal and mixed metaplasias. Uh, these are very common, especially uh, tubal metaplasia. Uh, but uh, this can be a source for atypical findings on pap smears, uh, as these tubal metaplasias can look quite atypical sometimes. Uh, the glands tend to be uh, similar in size to normal endocervical glands, whereas adenocarcinoma in situ and things like that tend to have uh, smaller or expanded glands or both. Um, additionally, these uh, tubal metaplastic cells can be P16 positive. However, they're more in the splotchy, patchy pattern that would be uh, typical of uh, endometrial uh, uh, epithelium. And usually they'll have cilia. However, the caveat there is that adenocarcinoma in situ with cilia has uh, also been uh, reported in rare instances. So here's an example, and we see a little bit more endometrioid type stroma. We see these uh, sort of wandering irregular uh, glands. Um, and we see that th there's no real mucin content to these uh, epithelial cells. But what we do see that's helpful, even at low power, is a little bit of a splotchy clearing. Uh, 
uh, sort of a peg cell identify identification that you can almost make from low power areas like this. Uh, that's not characteristic of adenocarcinoma in situ, but it is very characteristic of uh, tubal metaplasia. Take a look at a little higher magnification, and at higher magnification, you can see these are the peg cells that we're talking about have slightly cleared cytoplasm. And then notice that here we see nice uh, uh, terminal bars and ciliated uh, epithelial uh, surfaces uh, that are characteristic of tubal metaplasia. Uh, here's a combination of sort of tubal and endometrioid uh, type change uh, where you'll get some uh, ciliated cells uh, as we see here, uh, and then other areas without cilia that just look more endometrioid. I don't have the typical endocervical type epithelium say that we have over here on the left. Endometriosis also can uh, present uh, uh, in the cervix. Uh, it's usually incidental, um, and, but maybe both superficial or deep, um, and occasionally resulting in a mass-like lesion and, and uh, potentially a concern or uh, differential consideration of uh, malignancy. Uh, recognizing the stromal cells, of course, is very helpful to the diagnosis, uh, but those may be sparse or only evident on uh, immunohistochemistry, such as uh, CD10. And in this situation, uh, P16 also can be positive in some circumstances. Again, usually in the more splotchy pattern uh, rather than the diffuse blocky positivity of uh, adenocarcinoma in situ. Uh, this is also a uh, not infrequent com finding following uh, prior surgical procedures, curatages, uh, cone biopsies, those sorts of things can uh, result in implantation of uh, endometrial tissue in the cervix. So here's what we see uh, here, low magnification on the left, a nice area of uh, endometrial uh, tissue here on the bottom and normal endocervical glandular tissue up above. You can see the contra contrast between the type of epithelium, the cytoplasm, and at higher magnification, we see the NC ratio is higher, the stroma is altered and a little bit different. Uh, and here we can see a little bit more of that, maybe with a little suggestion of some tubal metaplasia. Um, now we will occasionally find mitotic figures in this and that shouldn't uh, dissuade us from making that diagnosis or discourage us. Uh, here's a, a more stromal type endometriosis, a endometriosis with sparse glands, if you will. Uh, this might occasionally uh, masquerade as endometrial stromal sarcoma or something of that sort. Uh, and here's where, you know, mitotic uh, activity, the vasculature and so forth would be uh, useful features, as well as the lack or absence of any uh, invasive or uh, more widespread uh, type of pattern of continuity of tumor type growth. growth. Uh, also, as uh, noted here, this could possibly suggest uh, Kaposi's sarcoma, although that's exceedingly rare uh, in the cervix, uh, even in HIV positive patients. Now, endocervicosis is the term that's used for uh, deep uh, endocervical type glands involving the uh, deeper stroma. Uh, this is analogous to adenomyosis in the endometrium or salpingitis isthmica nodosa in the fallopian tubes. Uh, but again, this can be difficult to distinguish from a low grade endocervical carcinoma. Um, and some other types of uh, neoplasms. Uh, stroma, again, can be useful. Lack of atypia or lack of uh, dysplasia in the overlying uh, surface epithelium is uh, useful. So here's a little bit of what that looks like. You get deep plunging glands, uh, normal type epithelium, no hyperchromasia, stratification, mitoses, and so forth. Uh, varying sizes and shapes to these glands and extending far deeper than the normal endocervical type uh, glandular mucosa. Uh, here's another example showing the uh, reactive stroma around these and a very bland appearance to this uh, uh, tissue. Uh, now, uh, having mentioned that, I think that making the diagnosis of endocervicosis without explanation uh, may prompt a phone call from your clinicians who say, what's this all about? What does this mean? Um, because uh, this is not a commonly uh, a reference term in uh, surgical pathology and therefore may not be familiar to many uh, gynecologists. 
Endothalpingiosis uh, uh, rarely can involve the, end of the cervical stroma and deeper tissues, um, and uh, of course is benign. Uh, differentiating it from low-grade carcinoma occasionally may be a little bit difficult, especially if you have a setting where you have overlying endocervical carcinoma, adenocarcinoma in situ type lesion. So here's uh, the example. Here we see uh, tubal metaplastic type epithelium, uh, but in a location that is not uh, connected to the mucosa. So it can look just like tubal metaplasia, but be involving the deep stromal tissues um, and therefore not uh, derived from the uh, mucosa per se, uh, particularly common on the uh, deeper tissues and so forth. Uh, deep glands and cysts, so uh, these occasionally can occur, um, sort of like uh, large Nebothian cysts that get displaced into uh, deeper locations. Uh, here in these lesions, the mucus is very, very thick and sticky. Uh, kind of uh, uh, gelatin-like. Um, and that's different than many mucinous carcinomas, which uh, are, again, rare in the, uh, in the cervix. Um, here's a gross image showing you what uh, uh, this looks like on cross-section. Here's the endocervical canal. And you see these very large, variably sized cystic structures with this tenacious uh, mucus uh, within them. Uh, so deep Nebothian cysts. Uh, are uh, a feature uh, in this situation. And under the microscope, they can look like this, very uh, large dilated spaces, simple uh, filled cysts and, and no complex epithelium in these. Now, related to this are these uh, more proliferative hyperplastic uh, glands that we can see here. So you may have a combination of deep glands and cysts, as well as uh, endocervical glandular hyperplasia uh, going on as we see here. Another uh, benign entity is oxophilic metaplasia. This is usually uh, very focal um, and oftentimes won't even merit uh, mention, uh, but can be uh, of concern because sometimes there's nuclear atypia. Um, and so not seeing mitoses or stratification or other malignant features can reassure one, uh, but certainly at high magnification cells like this, uh, a little bit of pleomorphism and this very eosinophilic cytoplasm looks quite different than the normal endocervical cells. And so wondering about a clear cell carcinoma with eosinophilic cytoplasm or some sort of other uh, variant of adenocarcinoma is understandable, but you would not see obviously invasive confluent growth, other features of malignancy to steer you in that direction. So um, having said that, let's uh, go on now to a, a little bit more uh, bizarre and atypical finding, uh, that of prostatic ectopia. Uh, this is decidedly rare. Uh, only about 40 cases have been reported, uh, usually as either ectopic prostate or maybe sometimes uh, in the terminology of displaced Skene's glands. Uh, again, usually this is an incidental finding not related to clinical disease. Uh, but may be found in conjunction with other procedures or processes. Uh, these typically have both basal cells and secretory cells and may occasionally show up with squamous metaplasia. Uh, they will uh, light up with PSA and some myoepithelial markers, but also have estrogen and potentially androgen receptor markers as well. So if I showed you this uh, picture in a GU lecture, you would say, oh, looks like prostatic hyperplasia. Uh, the only difference in this case is that this was present uh, in the uterine cervix. Um, here's another higher magnification view showing uh, uh, immunohistochemical staining with PSA on the, on the right here, and this area of squamous metaplasia within the glandular structure here. Again, this is not something I think we would diagnose as malignant, uh, but we might kind of scratch our heads and wonder what this is uh, really uh, representing here. There are a few other ectopias that can occur in the cervix, uh, bone, fat, sebaceous glands, and so forth. Let's take a look at some of these. Here's an endocervical gland, and as you see surrounding in the stroma, there's little uh, sort of uh, microcystic uh, lipocytes uh, representing ectopic fat. Uh, another uh, finding that can occasionally be seen is sebaceous uh, ectopias. Um, 
sort of a uh, dermoid cyst, if you will, type of thing without uh, the cystic component. And uh, that's, again, a completely benign finding. Um, now let's talk about a, a fairly frequently uh, uh, encountered uh, finding uh, that, uh, that has been designated tunnel clusters. Uh, these are of uh, two types. Um, one is uh, the non-dilated type, and the second is the cystic type, which we alluded to pre pre previously. Uh, these are more frequent in multiparous women uh, later on in adult life. Um, they typically have a lobular configuration and have no atypia at all. Uh, so it's usually not a problem to be concerned about malignancy, uh, other than they seem to be forming a little bit of uh, a mass lesion. Uh, in the non-cystic uh, clusters, though, you may occasionally find a mitotic figure or a, a marginal degree of atypia. So here is this uh, nice lobulated cluster appearance. Uh, and here we have both dilated and non-cystic uh, uh, varieties in the same field. Here's another non-cystic tunnel cluster here. And you can see here at higher magnification, there is occasional slightly hyperchromatic cells associated with this. But just as in, you know, sialometaplasia or other types of uh, lesions elsewhere in the body, this very nice uniform uh, lobular architecture helps to reassure you uh, that this is a benign lesion. An entity that was described, uh, oh, some 25, 30 years ago is called microglandular hyperplasia, uh, which uh, in some circumstances can be concerning for uh, malignancy. Uh, but it's been discovered and found that this is uh, oftentimes related to uh, hormonal shifts uh, in the body uh, in the reproductive years. Uh, so particularly uh, at the conclusion of pregnancy or uh, onset of pregnancy, uh, these kind of lesions can uh, occur uh, or with the use of exogenous hormones as well. The glands are very closely packed, uh, located superficially, and there's lots of inflammatory cells in the lumen here. Um, again, only rarely do we see mitotic or activity or atypia, uh, but occasionally uh, the differential will uh, come to include uh, carcinomas like endocervical or clear cell types. So here's a nice uh, photographic image showing you this clustered glandular appearance and you see these inflammatory cells in this very busy uh, appearing uh, lesion. Normal endocervical epithelium here on the edge and then this very clustered hyperplastic zone here with a mixture of almost uh, um, um, ovulation type changes in some of the uh, glands with subnuclear uh, vacuoles, uh, a little bit of maybe squamous metaplasia or in immature metaplasia and even some surface inflammation as you see over here. Here's a higher magnification view showing that you you have very minimal or no uh, cytologic atypia um, and you do get a lot of vacuolization to these uh, epithelial cells as you see here. Um, Here's some other examples, uh, a little bit on the paler side of things, but you can see it can get quite confluent and therefore uh, the differential of uh, neoplasia comes into play. Uh, but once you recognize the inflammatory pattern um, and uh, that these are very localized uh, type of lesions um, without other risk factors and so forth, it's usually not a problem to differentiate uh, from malignancies. Now, uh, another rare entity uh, is uh, what's been termed diffuse laminar endocervical hyperplasia. Uh, this is defined as a circum circumferential zone of hyperplastic glands with very sharply circumscribed margins. A little bit of atypia may be present, some chronic inflammation commonly seen, and occasionally this enters into the, the differential of the uh, adenoma malignum or a very well differentiated endocervical adenocarcinoma. So here's a, a nice example of this. Uh, we see lo clustered lobulated glands, very sharp demarcation, um, not really much atypia. We see normal uh, cytoplasmic mucin. Uh, and notice the chronic inflammation associated with this. And we can see that at low power here, these scattered foci of lymphocytic inflammation. That's a very, very helpful feature uh, 
uh, in these lesions of uh, diffuse laminar uh, glandular hyperplasia. Uh, lobular endocervical hyperplasia is uh, also uh, usually an incidental finding um, and usually uh, has uh, many small glands surrounding a more medium-sized or large gland. Um, again, this can uh, sometimes be uh, mistaken for uh, tunnel clusters or something of that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, the fact that in some of these uh, we get a so-called pyloric phenotype uh, has resulted in some people using the term uh, gastric or enteric type metaplasia. Um, and this may be uh, a link to certain types of uh, gastric type uh, endocervical adenocarcinomas. So here's our nice image showing here a, a central uh, dilated larger duct with some surrounding uh, tightly clustered uh, smaller glands. So lobulated structure. The difference here between, between uh, um, laminar endocervical glandular hyperplasia is that this is localized and lobular and not uniformly uh, circumferential. Um, although obviously on a biopsy, uh, you might not have that uh, ability to differentiate that. Here's another uh, higher magnification view of this lobular uh, hyperplasia. And, you know, is there a problem if you don't recognize this as a, that particular entity? Well, because the outcome is going to be benign and so forth, it's, uh, it's not a great sin if you don't have a specific name for this uh, in your diagnostic report. And uh, that also is an important consideration at times. Now, something that probably does deserve uh, mention, uh, but is probably underreported, is adenoid basal hyperplasia. Uh, this tends to arise in the area of uh, subcolumnar reserve cells, and so therefore it can sometimes be misinterpreted as just reserve cell hyperplasia. But it becomes adenoid basal hyperplasia when it begins to have some downward budding, and, and therefore becomes potentially a more uh, worrisome uh, precursor of adenoid basal carcinoma. It does lack uh, P16 staining or any mitoses or squamous metaplastic changes. Uh, and here's what it looks like. You see it sort of just looks like this uh, basal or budding uh, arising off of endocervical glandular uh, structures. Uh, and so you can see the similarity with, uh, you know, basal hyperplasia, uh, in some areas uh, and other organ systems. So those are some uh, fairly rare and uncommon entities that uh, deserve mention, uh, or at least uh, an awareness uh, for you as you begin to work with a uh, larger number of cervical samples. Uh, another entity that uh, we encounter with some frequency, and certainly if you're looking for it, uh, you can encounter it uh, more, more frequently, and that's those uh, mesonephric remnants. Uh, these are present in up to 10% of uh, women, um, usually, again, are an incidental finding, um, but perhaps are not sampled as, as frequently since they tend to be more lateral uh, at 3 and, and, and 9 o'clock, uh, whereas most uh, uteri are sampled at uh, 6 and 12 uh, in, in terms of routine surgical pathology. Uh, these cells may be CD10 and P16 positive, so you have to be a little bit careful about uh, overdiagnosis of adenocarcinoma. And occasionally you'll be helped because you'll be able to see a remnant of the mesonephric duct. Um, they typically have a PAS positive secretion within the lumen. It's very characteristic pink. And there is absolutely no stromal response. Uh, these can be PAX2 positive, um, uh, usually not PAX8 positive and uh, usually, again, have no surface connection. So they're deep in the stroma. Uh, here's what uh, a typical uh, finding might be. Here's your mesonephric duct remnant. And then you see these surrounding small ductal tubular structures uh, with this uh, characteristic uh, eosinophilic luminal secretion. And notice how small the cells are and the glands themselves tend to be very small. Uh, sometimes, even when they're present, you may miss them because they tend to just fade right into the background stroma. So if you don't have the characteristic uh, re duct remnant, you may miss them entirely uh, unless you're uh, an astute observer. Uh, here's a higher magnification view, again, showing you this uh, eosinophilic uh, 
uh, secretion, it's a PIS positive, and then very low cuboidal type uh, cells. Now, when these become hyperplastic, uh, that can occasionally present uh, uh, a problem, and you'll see a little bit more uh, uh, evidence of maybe a small mass like lesion. Uh, here's the higher magnification view. But again, notice we have no stromal reaction. The glandular structural shape is very rounded. Um, the cells are very low cuboidal and have very minimal atypia. However, when they become a little bit hyperplastic and you start to get a little bit of papillae uh, in them, uh, that's when things get more exciting. Um, so mesonephric duct hyperplasia uh, should be distinguished from adenocarcinoma in situ or other lesions uh, when you find and encounter this type of atypia. Uh, features that would suggest mesonephric hyperplasia uh, are any associated elongated duct, these micropapillae, and an absence of significant nuclear atypia. Uh, also, if you don't see endocervical glands associated with it, uh, that may help you. As we've indicated, P16 may not be particularly helpful, uh, although the CEA uh, staining, um, again, may or may not help you in this situation. PAX uh, staining may help you as some endocervical uh, uh, carcinomas are PAX8 positive, but not all. Uh, so again, this is a challenging area, um, and just be aware of that pitfall uh, should it arise. The geography and location probably is the most important uh, help uh, to dis help you distinguish those two. Well, there are several reactive patterns that can be seen in the cervix as well, uh, often related to uh, interventions that have occurred uh, or life events, such as uh, delivery and uh, postpartum uh, states. So uh, biopsy, of course, uh, is one of those uh, traumatic uh, events in the cervix that can prom provoke a response. Uh, and here's one where you've got sort of a, a small cluster of squamous epithelial cells that look for all the world like this could be invading the stroma. Um, and here, again, a slightly irregular appearance and, and maybe some keratinization. So concern for a keratinizing squamous carcinoma can arise. However, this could be a post-cone uh, metaplastic reparative change as well. And so correlation with the prior biopsy and uh, careful concern for the kind of area you're in looking to see if you've got the uh, stromal reactive changes like this uh, hematoidin deposition over here on the left uh, can be helpful in distinguishing that. Uh, not just uh, uh, squamous mucosa can produce uh, reactive atypia, but the endocervical cells can also themselves become somewhat atypical. Uh, and here you can see some sort of reactive uh, variable atypia. Notice how widely spaced these nuclei are. This is not the typical finding for either clear cell carcinoma or for endocervical adenocarcinoma. Another feature in these reactive changes, of course, is the uh, uh, formation of syncytia with uh, multinucleation, uh, as evidenced here. Uh, and multinucleation is most commonly in the cervix a reactive phenomenon, just as it is in the endobronchial tree, uh, but in the cervix uh, in particular, uh, this is not a typical characteristic of uh, uh, endocervical malignancies. Here's another example of uh, atypia, in this case, uh, related to uh, post-radiation therapy. Um, and so seeing nuclear variability, see here's some nuclear vacuolization we see here in several of these nuclei. A little smudginess maybe to some of the nuclei uh, and just a variable uh, degree of atypia that's present without mitotic activity uh, or other uh, proliferative changes. Uh, another uh, change that can be seen is if you get gland rupture, uh, you can get uh, sort of a periglandular uh, mucin granuloma with a pseudo uh, diathesis type change within the lumen. Uh, as we've mentioned, incomplete glands in other organs like the pancreas are frequently a, a feature of malignancy, uh, but not necessarily in the uh, endocervix, especially if there's been uh, any sort of trauma there. 
Now coming down to the inflammatory lesions that we can see in the cervix, of course, very commonly see chronic cervicitis at the transition zone. Um, and that can take a, a usual pattern, a sort of a diffuse pattern, or in some circumstances, you'll actually get the development of uh, follicular cervicitis with germinal center formation. Um, and then there are things that can masquerade and look like other uh, disorders. So let's take a look at some of these. Here's a typical uh, uh, usual cervicitis, in this case, forming a sort of papillary structures. Uh, but this uh, dense uh, lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate within the stroma. Um, maybe you would see a little bit of acute inflammation, but this is mostly a chronic cervicitis. And typically this would be at or very near the uh, cervical transition zone. Now, as we mentioned, if we get the development of germinal centers, a starry sky pattern here, we would prefer to use the term follicular cervicitis as opposed to here, uh, maybe a more diffuse uh, cervicitis involving the uh, superficial portions of the cervix. Uh, this is a, a sort of lymphoma-like uh, appearance. Uh, lymphomas do occur in the cervix, um, and so you have to be aware of them and look carefully and evaluate these occasionally with immunohistochemistry, uh, but this band-like pattern is uh, part of the spectrum of uh, usual cervicitis. And here, uh, seeing this uh, pattern, you'd want to see what the composition is. Here we can see both plasma cells, large and small uh, lymphocytes, admixed with some uh, pycnotic cells, the rare mitotic figures, um, and so forth. Now, when the inflammatory pattern is uh, more histiocytic and it's sort of foamy in this situation, we would use the term xanthogranulomatous cervicitis. Uh, these are xanthoma cells, uh, indicating they have uh, lipid material within the cytoplasm, um, and that is uh, um, maybe related to uh, lipid metabolism disorders, maybe related to exposure to uh, a lipid-rich uh, uh, reagent or herbal remedy or who knows what, uh, but uh, should not be confused with uh, clear cell carcinomas or um, uh, signet ring cell carcinomas or those sorts of entities. Now, sometimes we see this kind of pseudostratification here uh, in the endocervical epithelium, um, and typically this is found uh, maybe adjacent to the margin of a uh, loop electrocautery excision procedure or leap excision. This is electrocautery artifact uh, that has uh, produced this stratification and seeming hyperchromasia in the endocervical glands. Another change that can be seen in the stroma with cautery is the signet ring type cell change. Here we see these uh, uh, fairly bland uh, stromal cells, but these uh, uh, droplet-like uh, structures forming almost uh, signet ring cells, as you see here. Uh, more commonly, uh, post-surgery, uh, you can see uh, this cauterized collagen type of change here that becomes uh, sort of purplish brown in some, some circumstances, may provoke a giant cell reaction here as we see on the right. Uh, and this can persist for some time uh, following hysterectomy. Uh, this was uh, as noted uh, six months following the initial uh, loop excision. Uh, here's another uh, reaction pattern, in this case to a Moncel solution, a mixture of silver nitrate and so forth that is uh, sometimes applied to the cervix to uh, highlight uh, glycogen versus non-glycogenated mucosa. And that also can produce this artifact and uh, should not be mistaken for um, other uh, significant findings. Now, uh, an entity that I uh, have no significant uh, experience with but is described as sort of woody cervicitis is uh, this uh, ligneous cervicitis. Uh, you get a very uh, amorphous uh, eosinophilic material, maybe with some uh, uh, residual cauterized uh, material here as well. Um, I would, uh, in this circumstance, uh, probably describe this as necrotic uh, debris and uh, in, in term it in, in somewhat of a ligneous fashion. Uh, arteritis can occasionally occur in the cervix. Here's a sort of polyarteritis type with part of the vessel involved by this inflammatory destructive process and the inflammatory cells sort of eating away at the uh, 
vessel wall. Um, so vasculitis knows no geographic uh, boundaries, uh, it seems. Uh, of course, uh, herpes simplex, other infectious disorders uh, can produce multinucleated giant cells, uh, most typically in the squamous epithelium, but occasionally also in the endocervical epithelium, uh, characterized with the uh, uh, typical uh, nuclear inclusions and sort of uh, uh, ground glass appearance uh, as well as the multinucleation. Uh, here's an example with cytomegalovirus, a, a different uh, type of viral inclusion, uh, which will have both nuclear and, in this case, you can see nice cytoplasmic inclusions as well. Uh, this is a, not a common finding in the cervix, but uh, should be fairly readily recognized, either if there's a clue of possible CMV infection or HIV infection to predispose the patient. So that covers some of those uh, inflammatory lesions. Let's talk about some of the pregnancy-related uh, changes that also can be found in the cervix and may show up on biopsies uh, if uh, there's concern uh, during pregnancy uh, for uh, display dysplasias or so forth. So, uh, of course, the most common uh, pregnancy-related change is the decidual reaction. And while the cervical stroma is not usually thought of as being uh, responsive to those uh, luteinizing changes, uh, in fact, on occasion it does, and particularly if there's been any endometriosis uh, in, involved in the area, it can, you can get that change in the cervix, just as you do in the tube or in other uh, uh, areas of the GYN tract. Um, area stellar reaction, as seen here, uh, pronounced papillarity, uh, nuclear uh, 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 bizarre changes in the nuclei, cytoplasmic uh, vacuolization, and sort of a, a hobnail type cell pattern uh, can be seen as well in endocervical glands as well as in endometrial glands. Um, cervical pregnancy itself can uh, sort of implantation in the lower uterine segment and cervix obviously can produce a mass and mass-like lesion related to um, uh, trophoblastic uh, invasion of the wall and involvement of the wall. Uh, and if you get abnormal placentation, then your risks of placenta accreta and placenta percreta uh, become greater um, and so forth. Uh, here's uh, just a very quick picture of multinucleated giant cells in the endocervical stroma, uh, which can occur at any point during the, uh, the uh, lower uh, gynecologic tract uh, stroma. Um, more common in the vulva and vagina, uh, but can occasionally also occur in the cervix. Uh, pigmented lesions, nevi, not unheard of within the uh, cervix, but decidedly rare. So if you see pigmentation, it's not always iron or uh, 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 cautery-related uh, entities. Uh, and this may appear clinically as a, a dark spot that uh, gets biopsied. Um, calcifications, uh, samomatous type calcifications occasionally also occur uh, in the cervix, not necessarily a feature of uh, 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 serous carcinoma or uh, other malignancy, but just related to uh, papillarity and uh, loss of vascularity to that area. So that sort of covers the landscape of things that I wanted to talk about today. I appreciate your time. Feel free to reach out to me with uh, questions. I'm always uh, amenable to taking. Uh, comments, and we hope that you'll like uh, this uh, video and uh, uh, subscribe. And if you have comments, please uh, note below, um, and uh, we'll hope to catch you up next time.